Well, I think that in many respects, his decline can be blamed on what should have been his greatest natural asset, a fantastic facility for improvisation. All composers of Mozart's day had that facility to some degree. They had to have it if they were to fulfill the unrealistic production quotas expected of 18th century Kapellmeisters. And a lot of them, like Mozart, were not easily persuaded of the value of an editor's blue pencil. <laughs> remarked when he pretended to be catching Bach out at a similar game. I bet he had his mind on something else when he wrote that one. Well, it'll be idiotic to pretend that all of Mozart's works consist primarily of segments like that one from his C major Fantasia for piano, but there are relatively few works, especially from those later years, which aren't at some point disrupted by events of that kind, events which compromise the intensity of the work, even as they add to its pretensions. Because the thing about improvisation is that it has to come quickly. It can't pose too many technical challenges. It's pretty well limited to the sort of music making that results from split-second reaction, and it must rely heavily on devices that have already secured a place in the mainstream of musical activity. And those clichés that Mozart found so useful had been the stock in trade of composers a generation before his time. The scales and arpeggios to which he resorted continuously were as irrelevant to the real musical cares of his day as the champagne shilly-shelling of Lawrence Welk is to ours. And as Mozart grew older and abused this facility for improvising, his best ideas were necessarily aborted by those clichés. Because, in fact, a computer could produce them, really, with a minimum of programming and so could a five-year-old after a few weeks of theory lessons. So one begins to wonder whether, in circumstances like that, the composer is, in fact, really necessary. And this, strangely enough, is a question that one can profitably ask today, because much of the activity in the art world just now suggests that the isolated artist, romantic figure that he is, is being attacked and may well succumb to the free-wheeling attitude of the chance composers, the random paint-throwers, the mixed-media enthusiasts, and such less aggressively nihilistic souls as the happening devotees who simply want to draw the audience into the making of a work of art. Well, I'm all for it. At least I'm all for that latter idea. If it could be soberly approached, I'd like to think that it could be done, that the audience could, in fact, get into the making of a work of art as a participant. But there are more dangers menacing that idea than anyone has taken time to calculate as yet. And not least among those dangers is the hedonistic pursuit of improvisation as a way of life. And that's why I think we can learn from Mozart why his reliance in his late works on a facility for improvisation provides a real object lesson for the 20th century. Because the 20th century is the age of the debatable motive, an age occupied with the problem of whether and to what degree our thoughts derive from a conscious industry or result from concealed desires. So most of us look for signs of premeditation in art. We need to be assured that what's being said has to be said, that even amidst the most elusive rhetoric, a calculating, creative mind is, however deviously, at work. Beethoven's was just such a calculating mind, and usually deviously at work. Legend has it that he was every bit Mozart's equal as an improviser, and yet many of the great moments in his scores are the least improvisatorily inclined he had, in fact, a unique ability to simulate improvisation, to pretend that he was improvising, without, in fact, ever deviating from a scrupulously plotted course. like the sort of music almost anyone might think that they could improvise. It doesn't really seem to be getting anywhere at all, but Beethoven's been holding a great climactic surprise in reserve, and that deceptively tranquil episode ensures that when it arrives, we'll be cut off guard. <laughs> Thank you.
That's the real difference between those two composers. Beethoven can appear to be noodling dilettantishly about, as he seemed to be in that example from the Fifth Symphony, and in fact, all the while, be realizing some very subtle aspect of his design. But if Mozart seems to be going nowhere in a hurry, the chances are that's exactly where he's at. And that's the point about improvisation and the music that derives from it. For all its charm and brilliance and capacity to entertain, it doesn't usually provide moments like that. Moments which sacrifice immediate appeal in order to support a long-range projection. Moments in which the composer, in effect, practices what you might call a psychology of denial. The inveterate improvisers, like Mozart, are as caught up in the glory of the moment as the social climber in the jet stream of cafe society. They just can't take the long-range view. Perhaps it all comes down to this. Within every creative person, there's an inventor at odds with the museum curator. And most of the extraordinary and moving things that happen in art are the result of a momentary gain by one at the expense of the other. In Mozart's case, the inventor was endowed with the most precocious gifts, and the curator who manufactured all those sequences and arpeggiated links and passages of scale padding zealously carried out his duties as well. But what I object to is that Mozart tries to cover up the conflict between them. Time and again, the curator wins out over the inventor, as he has every right to do. But I'd, I'd like to find some evidence of protest, some frantic, disruptive, unsyntactical attempt on the part of the inventor to get free of the curator's control. Or in the absence of that desperation move, I'd like Mozart to feel guilty. And because of that guilt, to sacrifice something of the charm and courtesy which mask the humanity of his work. And he should feel guilty, because in his early works, Mozart came very close to realizing the possibilities for experiment that would exist within even the most stylized form. His early sonatas, concertos, and symphonies were extraordinarily flexible and inventive to a degree that he never quite equaled later on. Yet somehow the very people who look to these later works for a message I don't think they contain give a once-over lightly to those incredible pieces that he produced in his earlier days. Mozart's achievement is all the more remarkable when you consider what very great odds he had to overcome. All those wispy little ditties of the uh, steel gallon, as we like to call it, taken their toll, you know. The chap didn't come through unscathed. Oh, my, no, not that. Well, even those of us who can't quite concede that Mozart was the embodiment of all musical virtue and we're a much maligned and harassed minority group have our own favorites from among his voluminous output. My Mozart preference is for the work of his teenage years, and as far as the piano sonatas are concerned, those which he wrote during and shortly after his visit to Paris, which took place during his 22nd year. These are glorious pieces, lean, fastidious, and possessed of that infallible tonal homing instinct with which the young Mozart was so generously endowed. And despite everything that I've been saying in these last few minutes, I love them. I'm going to play the last of the sonatas which he wrote during that Paris trip, it bears number 333 in Mr. Kershaw's catalog, and it's in the key of B-flat major. <laughs> 